Hello and welcome to Guftagu. Today we have with us Kumkum Sangari. She's a feminist scholar and someone who's been involved with the feminist movement for a long time. But besides that, she her work has been extremely, extremely wide ranging. And in a way, if I introduce her just as a feminist scholar, is actually to limit the range of her work. Thank you very much, Kumkum Sangari, for your time and joining us here. It's good to be here. I'll now uh, uh, quote something from the introduction that you write with Sudesh Ved in the very seminal work that you did, uh, Recasting Women, uh, which, uh, by the way, for our viewers, is uh, selected as a high quality classic history test book by the ACLS for the History Ebook Project. So, congratulations on that, though I feel this must have happened way back. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. Uh, there you write that a feminist historiography rethinks, like both of you write, that a feminist historiography rethinks historiography as a whole and discards the idea of women as something to be framed by a context in order to be, in order to be able to think of gender difference as both structuring and structured by a wide set, set of social relations. In this sense, feminist historiography is a choice open to all historians. Um, and at it, and sometime later, both of you will say that uh, it's actually counterproductive to sort of uh, think of women as a kind of numerical number that you have to insert. Okay, I have done this kind of study, and then suddenly I'll have a, an, an extra chapter on the women question on this very subject. Uh, and such uh, attitudes or methods might result in something that is counterproductive to the uh, to the intention of that said scholar. So. Oh, like, what is it that you that you mean that women should not be included as a category, as, as a kind of as a kind of numerical number? What is what is that? See, at the time when we uh, wrote that book, one of our in the nineteen eighties, and in, you know we commissioned the book, and one of the interesting things was that there was no model for the book, so we actually looked around for people historians who had done work on a particular period and then ask them to think their materials again, mm. keeping you know, the whole process of gendering and the you know, in relationship to caste and class formation. So as a result, we had a number of men in our book, mm. which not all feminists at the time liked because they thought that, you know, how can you? But we thought it was really a question of making a turn away with scholarly expertise from given problematics into something new and different. And the additive question is very interesting. You know, at that time, there was this whole trend also of saying, you know, women and the Bengali novel or something like that. There was always that and. Mm -hmm. And so it was like an additive mode where you just added women to some existing, you know, corpus or or some existing social question, and then you sort of inserted women into it. Now, this was very uncomfortable because it didn't see the fact that gendering is central to any and every historical moment. And you can hardly, you know, just sort of add women. You have to have to build, you know, make a new object of inquiry. You have to build, you know, a new problematic. And you have to ask different questions of the same material. And the other thing we were, you know, really, um, which, which still exists, we were very upset with the compartmentalization of women's issues. So that, you know, it, you know, this was something that, you know, some women would do and they would, you know, carry this work out in, under the rubric of women's studies. But why so? Why shouldn't every discipline be engaged? in you know rethinking itself and its uh, you know major problematics so that you know there were, women's studies was very nebulous at the time by the way it was very thinly institutionalized mm -hmm. and uh, we we felt and and i still feel that still exists this this segregation of women's studies women's questions from mainstream disciplines hasn't disappeared entirely it has it has you know become much less than it was at the time and uh, the second part of your question is that uh, all historiography, just no, remind so, me. Uh, so you said that feminist historiography is a choice open to all historians. Yes. It's not a... Yes. That it's not something that has to be conducted by feminists, you know, certified feminists in the, in the women's movement alone. And, and I think here also, you know, one, 
I remember that what was at stake was the very nature of historiography. Now, if you have, uh, for instance, um, the well-known fact that, you know, lower castes, women, and so on, hardly appear in the historical archives in the way they are, you know, foundationalized in the women's movement or in anti-caste movements. So how do you read, you know, reread history? And one of the things that became very important to us in the 1980s became especially important in the work that Sudesh and I did on widow immolation, which we actually left out of recasting women. There was no space in the book for it. Was that we thought that scholars should return to primary texts. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't just read history books. Because history books as they existed, you know, but very banal on the woman question, they would give you a kind of list of male reformers from Raja Ram Mohan Roy onwards, and it didn't do very much to understand what was, what had happened in the 19th century or earlier. So I remember, for instance, for the widow immolation work, you know, we started rereading the Akbar Nama, and, and suddenly the whole picture changed. There was so much more that could be gleaned from that material than had been done. And this was the case with everything, with, with the corpus of uh, the sants and bhakts and Sufis. Wherever you looked, you found that the historical corpus was much richer than what had been used by historians till then, because historiography you know, was constructed in a very different way, very ungendered. And when I say ungendered, it means that it was not looking even at the way masculinity was constructed, for instance. This was not just about women. It wasn't looking at the fact that you couldn't talk about class without talking about patriarchies. You couldn't talk about caste without looking at patriarchies because they're all constructed together. This was not some intersection between caste, class, and patriarchy. They're, they're interlocking. You know, it's not as if patriarchy pre-exists class or class and caste pre-exists patriarchy. They're all formed together if you look back historically. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> so then, you know, how, how, you know, what would be the tools of a new feminist historiography? Mm -hmm. And at the time, there was very little work done that we could draw on. So, um, you know, we had to actually, the, this book was commissioned. It didn't come out of a conference. It came out of an idea that Sudesh and I had about um, having a textbook for history MA students in Delhi University to whom we could recommend some reading, right? So it came from a very limited ambition. And, uh, the, you know, so uh, in, in that sense, I think what happened very interestingly was that many of the persons who wrote for Recasting Women were writing about gender for the first time. So it took three years to, you know, complete that book because there was so much doing and froing between you know, us as editors and the various writers. And, you know, some kind of perspective then began to emerge, uh, or rather the perspective that we began with began to get fleshed out, new things arrived according to the kind of material, you know, that uh, was being, um, you know, explored by the contributors to the volume. And some of the people who contributed to that book went on to become gender theorists. And some, you know, no longer wrote about it, as it were. But I think it, it was a very significant moment of saying, go back to the archive, go back to the primary text, look again. And that looking became very rich. So I think the, the question of historiography then is, you know, located very much in the present. I mean, after all, we were looking for agential models, we were looking for transformative moments in the past, and we would only do that because, you know, we were so much in the present. So you looked at Mirabai or, you know, other figures for that reason. But then when you looked at them, you didn't find some pure, uh, you know, and um, sort of feminine ances feminist ancestress. What you actually found was a great deal of ambiguity and contradiction. I think that became very important in my understanding that one, what one is looking for is actually not just moments of transformation, but moments of contradiction, which can lead to something new. Whether that, you know, that potential was historically fulfilled or not, you know, is not the main thing, but the fact that it existed became really important. So in that sense, there is a presentness as you 
asked me earlier, you know, in, in that uh, kind of work. But the presentness is not um, just a simple matter of saying, is this relevant for our time? Because I think sometimes things which are not apparently relevant for our time may turn out to be very significant mm -hmm. in understanding how we became what we did. So it's, it was also a question of how did, how did so much, you know, uh, so much uh, patriarchal abuse come to inhabit civil society? You know, so how did we become this, as it were? Mm -hmm. So it's in that sense also an excavation, um, the presentness. And I think that that question of relevance is a little bit misleading because when you enter a historical period, it has its own, um, it has its own uh, sense of being, which is both that it has a different epistemolo epistemology, it might have actually different ways of understanding ontology or the fact of being as well. So you, we can't just sort of carry over Mira into the modern and right. say, you know, we could be her like her or she could be like us. I think that would be a vulgarization. So, so one has to admit the, the strangeness of distance, not just grab it into some familiar vocabulary, but allow it, you know, allow that strangeness and unfamiliarity to speak to us insofar as we can interpret it. Um, and Finally, my question to you a little bit about, uh, I'd like to discuss a little bit about your work uh, purely in terms of literary studies, maybe because that's, I have a vested interest there because I come from that background. Um, uh, I don't know, have you, have you read this uh, short story called Cat Person, published in the New Yorker very recently? No. Uh, suddenly it seemed that folks who read New Yorker suddenly read something like a feminist story after a long, long time. <laughs> but I, I don't know if they read much of the fiction or non-fiction for that matter that comes out of the subcontinent, I wanted to say, well, we had that uh, for some time now. But uh, uh, like uh, when I was reading, like, and this was apparently widely shared on, uh, not apparently, but actually widely shared on, on social media and this uh, lady who wrote a fine story, short story, uh, went on to land, uh, like, uh, land a proper, like a nice deal with, with the publishing house. Um, but in that entire in that entire thing, like this book was sort of seen as this uh, story, that, like a fictional story of what what it means to date in modern times. Um, and at the same time, it was like like each and each and every commentator was very very keen to say that oh, this is from written from a woman's perspective. Um, what 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 do you make of uh, such uh, such assessments of literary works where this is written from a woman's perspective does it not fall into that same trap that we have we have this separate chapter on on women and etc cetera, etc cetera, whatever the rest of my study is see i think this category woman is a very difficult one and because women are class divided mm. women are caste divided and um, they are also divided in terms of access to, you know, power, access to cultural capital, um, access to certain kinds of avenues uh, for, let us say, employment or um, certain kinds of activity. So at some level, it has always been a problem for feminism. Uh, again, there have been like, you know, two bifurcating streams. One of them, you know, like radical feminism of the, you know, 1970s in America, they saw patriarchy as the main social contradiction. Um, the left has largely seen class as the main social contradiction and so on. And I think these are things that precisely the kind of challenges that you know, we began to take up with recasting women, mm -hmm. that you can't separate these out. And I think recasting women itself shows that women were actually very diverse. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the list of, you know, of, of essays in that, you know, you have working class women, tribal women, mm -hmm. rural peasant women in Haryana. You also have middle class women, you know, the Badra Mahilas that are coming up in West Bengal. What is it that unites them? And I think that is always a crucial question. Either if you put all your you know, money in sexual difference, then I think you know, it, it can be misleading 
because you also have women who consent to patriarchal norms, right? right? I think I wrote a long essay called Consent and Agency right. many years ago. Uh, and they consent for different reasons, you know, also from vulnerability, sometimes because they have bought into or invested in, uh, uh, or, or in patriarchal power because it has been delegated to them to practice inside the family and so on. So this is a very complex field. And a woman's point of view perhaps is the most banal and vulgar way of putting it, if I may say so. Uh, the question is, what is that story doing? What kind of gendering of social relations is it showing? Mm -hmm. And I think there would lie the test, not the fact that a woman, you know, and, and what is the set of, what is the sense of womanness that is operating there? I mean, sometimes I feel very strongly that women seem to be, as a category, united largely by sexist violence and labor. You know, it's domestic labor, which is, um, you know, usually falls to women or in upper and middle class women, it's the supervision of domestic labor, which is another form of labor, though it's filled with power. And then you have, as we see, I mean, as we see the, the, this increasing sexist violence, which has been happening now in India. You know, we, we are never sure whether it's actually increasing or it's being reported more. But certainly that category woman is composed, you know, very often by labor and violence in our context. Mm -hmm. So I would say that I would hesitate to, you know, I think there has, there is a feminist unity, you know, around the concept, you know, of, of women, which came up from the second phase of the women's movement. But it's also been, uh, you know, it's also something where you have to use it very carefully and to see precisely what that notion of women signifies. Uh, does it really signify women of all castes, of all classes, of all religions? If it does so, what are the commonalities between them? So I think it's a question of weaving one's way, both analytically and empirically, through commonalities and differences. And then also thinking about the fact that are we only talking of heteronormativity? What about you know non-heterosexual? Uh, you know, um, groups, you know, how do they relate to the category, you know, woman or even to feminism? These are all now very pressing, pressing questions. So I would say this woman's point of view sometimes would be, you know, for the New Yorker might just be a selling point. Yeah, but, uh, you know, you'd have to tell me what the story is really like. No, maybe we'll read it online after the interview. <laughs> But uh, Professor Kunkum Sangari, thank you so much for your time. Okay. I wish I wish we have all the time in the world to read and uh, delve into some of the other questions that you have raised. But unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Okay. And thank you thank very you. much. And thank you very much for watching.